from around the globe. It's theCUBE, with digital coverage of enterprise data automation. An event series brought to you by IO Tahoe. Hi everybody, we're back and this is Dave Vellante and we're covering the whole notion of automating data in the enterprise. And I'm really excited to have Paul D'Amico here. She's the Senior Vice President of Enterprise Data Architecture at Webster Bank. Paula, good to see you, thanks for coming on. Hi, nice to see you too. How are you Yeah, been? so let's, let's, start with, uh, let's start with Webster Bank. You guys are kind of a regional, I think New York, New England, uh, I believe headquartered out of Connecticut, but tell us a little bit about the bank. Yep, um, Webster Bank is regional Boston, Connecticut, and New York. Um, very focused on in Westchester and Fairfield County. Um, they are a really highly rated bank, regional bank for this area. They um, hold um, quite a few awards for the area for being supportive um, for the community and um, are really moving forward technology wise. They really want to be a data driven bank and they want to move into a more uh, robust group. Well, we got a lot to talk about. So data-driven, uh, that, that is an interesting topic. And your role as data architect, architecture is really Senior Vice President of Data Architecture. So you got a big responsibility as, as it relates to kind of transitioning to this digital data-driven bank. But tell us a little bit about your role and your organization. Right. Um, currently today we have a uh, a small group that is just working toward moving into a more futuristic, uh, more data-driven data warehousing. That's our first um, item. And then the other item is, is to drive new revenue by anticipating um, what customers do uh, when they go to the bank or when they log into their account uh, to be able to give them the best offer. And the only way to do that is, is if you have uh, timely, accurate, complete data on the customer and what's uh, really a great value on offer something to offer them or a new product or to help them um, continue to grow their savings or do and grow their investments. Okay, and, and, and I really want to get into that, but before we do, and I know you're you know, sort of partway through your journey, you, you got a lot, mm -hmm. lot to, to do, uh, but I want to ask you about COVID, uh, how you guys are you know, handling that. I mean, you had the government coming down and small business loans and PPP and, and huge okay. you know, volume of business and sort of data was at the heart of that. How did you manage through that? So we were extremely successful because we have a big dedicated team that understands where their data is and was able to switch much faster than a larger bank uh, to be able to offer the PPP loans at, to our customers uh, within lightning speed. And part of that was, is uh, we adapted to Salesforce very for we've had Salesforce in house for over 15 years. Um, you know, pretty much uh, that was the driving um, vehicle to get our PPPs loans in, um, and then developing logic quickly. But um, it was a 24/7 uh, development, roll in, get the data moving, um, helping our customers fill out the forms. And a lot of that was um, manual, but it was a uh, it was a large community effort. Well, the thing about that, I mean, the thing about that too is the volume was probably much much higher than, than the volume of loans to small businesses that you're used to granting. Absolutely. But and then also the the initial guidelines were very opaque. You really didn't know what the rules were, but you were expected to enforce them. And then finally you got more clarity. So you had to essentially code that logic into the yep. system in real I, time, right? I wasn't directly involved, but um, part of my data movement team was, and we had to change the logic overnight. So it was on a Friday night, it was released. We pushed our first set of loans through and then the logic changed um, from, you know, coming from the government, it changed. And we had to redevelop our, our uh, data movement pieces again and redesign them and send them back through. So it was, it was definitely um, kind of scary, but we were completely successful. We hit uh, a very high peak. I, I can't, I don't know the exact number, but it was in the thousands of loans um, from, you know, little loans to very large loans and uh, 
uh, not one customer who applied did not get what they needed for, um, you know, that was the right process and filled out the right amount of data. Well, that is an amazing story and really great support for, you know, the region, New York, Connecticut, you know, the, the Boston area. So that's, that's fantastic. I want to get into the, the rest of your story now. Let's start with some of the business drivers in banking. I mean, obviously online, I mean, a lot of people have sort of joked that many of the, the older people who kind of shunned online banking would love to go into the branch and see their friendly teller, had no choice you know, during this pandemic uh, to, to go to online. So that's obviously a big trend. You mentioned so, you know, the data-driven data warehouse. I want to understand that, but what, at the top level, what are, some of, what are some of the key business drivers that are, that are, that are catalyzing your desire for change? Um, the ability to give a customer what they need at the time when they need it. And what I mean by that is, is that we have um, customer interactions in multiple ways, right? And I want to be able for the customer to walk into a bank um, or online and see the same, the same um, format and being able to have the same feel, the same look, and also to be able to offer them the next best offer for them, for their, you know, if they want looking for a newer mortgage or looking to refinance or look, you know, whatever it is, um, that they have that data, we have the data, and that they feel comfortable using it. And that's that untethered banker um, attitude is, you know, whatever my banker is holding and whatever uh, the person is holding in their phone, that that is the same and it's comfortable. So they, they don't feel um, that they've, you know, walked into the bank and they have to do, fill out different paperwork compared to filling out paperwork on, you know, just doing it on their phone. Yeah, you actually, so, you want the experience to be better. I mean, and, and, and it is in many cases. Now, you, you weren't able to do this with your, your existing, I guess, mainframe based enterprise data warehouses. Is, is that right? Maybe. You can you mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit? Yeah, we were uh, definitely able to do it with what we have today, the technology we're using. But one of the issues is, is that it's not timely. Um, and, and you need a timely process to be able to get the customers to understand what's happening. Um, you, want a, you need a timely process so we can enhance our risk management. Um, we can apply for uh, fraud issues and things like that. Yeah, so you're trying to get you know, more real time. I mean, the traditional EDW, it's, it's sort of a science project. There's a few experts that know how to get it. You can sort of line up, the demand is tremendous. And then right. oftentimes by the time you get the answer, you know, it's outdated. So you're trying to address that problem. So, so part of it is really the, the cycle time, the end-to-end -end cycle time that you're, you're pressing. And, and then there's, if I understand it, residual benefits that are pretty substantial from a, a revenue uh, opportunity, other, other offers that you can you can make to the right customer um, that that you you maybe know uh, through your data is is that right? Exactly. It's um, drive new customers to new opportunities. It's enhance the risk, and it's to optimize the banking process, and then obviously to create new business. Um, and the only way we're going to be able to do that is if we have the ability to look at the data right when the customer walks in the door or right when they open up their app. And um, by doing, creating more near time, near real time data for the data warehouse team, that's giving the lines of business the ability to, to work on the next best offer for that customer as well. Apollo, we're inundated with data sources these days. Are there, are there mm -hmm. data sources that you, Maybe, maybe had access to before, but perhaps the, the backlog of ingesting and cleaning and cataloging and you know, right. uh, 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 analyzing, maybe the backlog was so great that you couldn't perhaps tap some of those data sources. Do you, do you see the potential to increase the, the, the data sources and hence the quality of, of the data or is that sort of too premature? Oh no, um, exactly right. So Right now we ingest a lot of flat files and um, from our mainframe uh, type of front end system that we've had for quite a few years. Uh, but now that we're moving to the cloud and off-prem and on-prem, you know, moving off-prem, 
into like an S3 bucket where that data can, we can process that data and get that data faster by um, using real time tools to move that data into a place where like Snowflake could um, utilize that data or we can give it out to our market. Okay, right so. Now, we're about, you know, we're, we, we do, we're in batch mode still. So we're doing 24 hours. Okay, so when I think about, you know, the, the data pipeline and the people involved, I mean, maybe you could, we could talk a little bit about the, the organization. I mean, you've got, I don't know if you have data scientists or statisticians, I'm sure you do. Uh, you got data architects, data engineers, quality engineers, right. uh, you know, the developers, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. And, and oftentimes practitioners like yourself will, will, will stress about, hey, the data's in silos, uh, the data quality is not where we want it to be. We, we have to manually categorize the data. These are all sort of common data pipeline problems, if you will. Sometimes we use the term data ops, which is sort of a, a play on DevOps applied to the data pipeline. I, 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 can you just sort of describe your situation in that context? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have a very a large data ops team and everyone that who is working on the data part of uh, Webster's Bank has been there 13, 14 years. So they get the data, they understand it, they understand the lines of business. Um, so it's right now, um, we could, it, we have data quality issues just like everybody else does, um, but we have, we have places in hand where that gets cleansed. Um, and we're moving toward, and there was very much silo data. The data scientists are out in the lines of business right now, which is great, because I think that's where data science belongs. We should give them, uh, and that's what we're working toward now, is giving them more self-service, giving them the ability to access the data um, in a more robust way, and it's a single source of truth, so they're not pulling the data down into their own like Tableau dashboards and then pushing the data back out. Um, so they're going to more not, I don't want to say a central repository, but a more of a robust repository that's controlled across multiple avenues where multiple lines of business can access that data. Does that help? Got it, yes. And I think that the, one of the key things that, that I'm taking away from your last comment is the cultural aspects of this. By having the data scientists in the line of business, the line of, lines of business will feel ownership of that data as opposed to pointing fingers, criticizing the data quality. They really own that, that problem as opposed to saying, well, it's, it's, it's Paula's problem. Right, well, I have, my problem is, is I have data engineers, data architects, da database administrators, right? Um, and then data, uh, traditional data reporting people. Um, and because some customers that I have that are business customers, lines of business, they want to just subscribe to a report. They don't want to go out and do any data science work. Um, and we still have to provide that. So we still want to provide them some kind of reg, you know, regiment that they wake up in the morning and they open up their email and there's the report that they subscribe to, um, which is great. And it works out really well. And one of the things is, is why we purchased IO Tahoe was I would have the ability to give the lines of business the ability to do search within the data and read the data flows and data redundancy and things like that and help me clean up the data. And also um, to give it to the data analysts who say, all right, they just asked me, they want this certain report. And it used to take, okay, well, we're gonna, four weeks, we're gonna go and we're gonna look at the data and then we'll come back and tell you what we can do. But now with IO Tahoe, they're able to look at the data and then in one or two days, they'll be able to go back and say, yes, we have the data, this is where it is, this is where we found it, this is the data flows that we found also, which is the, the what I call it is the birth of a column. It's where the column was created and where it went to live as a teenager <laughs> and then it went to, you know, die where we archived it. Um, and, you know, it's this, you know, cycle of life for a column and um, IO Tahoe helps us do that. And we do, data lineage is done all the time. Um, and it just takes a very long time. And that's why we're using something that has AI in it, machine learning, um, it's, it's accurate. It, it does it the same way over and over again. Um, if an analyst leaves, you're able to utilize something like Tahoe to be able to do that work for you.
if that helps. Yeah. Yeah, so got it. So, so a couple things there is in, in, in researching IO Tahoe, it seems like one of the strengths of their platform is the ability to visualize the data, the data structure and, and actually dig into it, but also see it. Um, and, and that speeds things up and gives everybody additional confidence. And then the other piece is essentially infusing uh, AI or machine intelligence into the data pipeline is really how you're attacking automation, right? And you're saying it's repeatable exactly. and and then that helps the data quality and then you have this virtuous cycle. Maybe you could sort of affirm that and add some color perhaps. Exactly. Um, so you're able to, let's say that uh, I, have a, I have seven lines of business that are asking me questions. And one of the questions they'll ask me is, um, we want to know um, if this customer is okay to contact, right? And you know there's different avenues. So you can go online to go do not contact me. You can go to the bank and you can say, I don't want um, email, but I'll take texts and I, I want you know, no phone calls. Um, all that information. So uh, seven different lines of business ask me that question in different ways. One said, you know, okay to contact. The other one says, you know, customer one, two, three, all these, you know. Um, and each project before, I got there used to be siloed. So one customer would, it would be a hundred hours for them to do that analytical work. And then another, another uh, analyst would do another hundred hours on the other project. Well, now I can do that all at once. And I can do those type of searches and say, yes, we already have that documentation. Here it is. And this is where you can find um, where the customer has said, you know, no, you don't want, I don't want to get access from you by email or I've subscribed to get emails from you. Got it, so okay. Yeah, okay, and then I want to come back to the cloud a little bit. So you, you, you mentioned S3 mm -hmm. buckets, so you, you're, you're moving to the Amazon cloud, at least you know, I'm sure you've got a, got a hybrid situation there. You mentioned Snowflake. Yeah. Um, you know, what was sort of the decision to move to the cloud? Obviously Snowflake is cloud only. Um, there's not an on-prem right. you know, version there. So right. what precipitated that? All right, so from, um, I've been in the data IT information field for the last 35 years. I started in the US Air Force and have moved on from since then. And um, my experience with uh, off-prem was with Snowflake, uh, with working with GE, with GE Capital. And that's where I, I met up with the team from IO Tahoe as well. And so it's a proven, um, so there's a couple of things. One is, is Informatica, is worldwide known to move data, right? Um, yep. They have two products. They have the on-prem and the off-prem. Um, I've used the on-prem and the off-prem. They're both great and it's very stable and I'm comfortable with it. Other people are very comfortable with it. So we picked that as our batch data movement. Um, we're moving toward probably HVR. It's not a total decision yet, but we're moving to HVR for real-time data, which is change capture data, you know, moves it into yep. the cloud. And then, um, so you're envisioning this right now, you can picture it, you're in the S3 and you have all the data that you could possibly want, and that's JSON, all that, everything, is sitting in the S3 to be able to move it through into Snowflake. And Snowflake has proven to have a stability. Um, you only need to learn and train um, your team with one thing, um, AWS has, is completely stable at this point too. So all these avenues, if you think about it, going through from, um, you know, this is your, your data lake, which is, I would consider your S3. And even though it's not a traditional data lake, like you can touch it like a, um, like a progressive or a dupe. And right. then from into Snowflake and then from Snowflake into sandboxes. So your lines of business and your data scientists can just dive right in. Um, that makes a big, uh, a big win. And then using IO Tahoe with the data automation and also their search engine, um, I have the ability to give the data scientists and the data analysts the, the way of, they don't need to talk to IT to get um, accurate information or completely accurate information from the structure. It will be right there. Yeah, so talking about you know Snowflake and getting up to speed quickly, I know from talking to customers, you can get from zero to Snowflake, you know, very fast. 
And then it sounds like the IO Tahoe is sort of the automation cloud for your data pipeline within the cloud. Is that, a, is that the right way to think about it? I think so. Um, right now I have IO Tahoe attached to my on-prem and um, I want to attach it to my off-prem eventually. So um, I'm using IO Tahoe's data automation right now to bring in uh, the data and to start analyzing the data flows to make sure that I'm not missing anything and that I'm not bringing over redundant data. Um, the data warehouse that I'm working off of is not um, a, it's an on-prem, it's an Oracle database, um, and it's 15 years old. So it has extra data in it. It has um, things that we don't need anymore. And IO Tahoe is helping me shake out that um, extra data that does not need to be moved into my S3. So it's saving me money when I'm moving from off-prem to on-prem. And so that, that was a challenge prior because you couldn't get the lines of business to agree what to delete or what was the issue there? Oh, oh it was more than that. Um, each line of business had their own structure within the warehouse. And then they were copying data between each other um, and duplicating the data and using that. Uh, so there might be, there could be possibly three tables that have the same data in it, but it's used for different lines of business. And so right. I have, we have identified using IO Tahoe, I've identified over seven terabytes in the last um, two months on data that has just been repetitive. Um, it just, it's the same exact data just sitting in a different schema. And, and that's not easy to find if you only understand one schema that's reporting for that line of business. So that's more been, yeah. Yeah, more bad news for the storage companies out there. <laughs> so Paul. It's cheap, that's what, you, that's what we were telling people. You yeah, know, storage, well, I mean, cheap. And it's true, but you still would rather not waste it. Uh, you'd like to apply it to you know, drive more revenue. And, and so I guess let's close on where you see this thing going. Again, I know you're sort of partway through the journey. Maybe you could sort of describe you know, where you see the phases going and really what you want to get out of this thing you know, down the road, midterm, longer term. What's your vision for your, your, your data-driven organization? Um. I want for the bankers to be able to walk around with an, uh, an iPad in their hand and be able to access data for that customer really fast and be able to give them the best deal that they can get. I want Webster to be right there on top with being able to add um, new customers and to be able to serve our existing customers who had bank accounts since they were 12 years old there and now are you know multi whatever um, I want them to be able to have the best experience with our our bankers and that's, that's awesome cool. I mean that's really what I want as a banking customer I want my bank to know who I am anticipate my needs and create a great experience for me and, and then let me go on with my life and uh, so that Paula Great story, love your experience, your background and, and your knowledge. Can't thank you enough for, for coming on theCUBE. No, thank you very much. And um, you guys have a great day. All right, take care. And thank you for watching everybody. Keep it right there. We'll take a short break and be right back.